Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today's episode is all about the beautiful Paku. But first, let's catch up around the colony. We've had a lot of things change and a lot of updates that have happened in the background. First, we've built some beautiful recreation rooms. I mean, what's better for the dupes? A couple of video games during the day, a little work during the night, you know, the standard dupe stuff. We've also added some pedestals. And the reason why we've been adding pedestals is because Elita continues on her artifact hunting missions. Elita is collecting all the space artifacts from the closer asteroids. And then we're going to set our sights on some of the terrestrial artifacts, the ones that are sitting on the asteroids. You may have missed it, but there's a couple more objectives here in the printing pod. Namely, Cosmic Archaeology. It wants you to study 10 terrestrial artifacts and 10 space artifacts. We're doing decent on the artifacts. We've collected now the robot arm, the self-contained system, the old small obelisk, the office mug, and the bioluminescent rock. But eventually we're gonna fill up these pedestals, so that's why we added these pedestals. That way we can hold more artifacts and figure, hey, let's build a recreation room around them. Now you'll notice the pixel packs behind there. We tried to get the colors as close to the colony colors as possible. Uh, but this is the brightest yellowish I think they have. You can see some graphical bugs. For some reason, even though there's a couple of masterpiece paintings back here, they don't always show up. We've also added a timer sensor in case we want to have a little fun with the dupes. We can set it to two and two for it's on and off. And then all of a sudden the dupes have a nice like party club scene here. Unfortunately, with these timers, it just adds more animation to the to the simulation. So we thought, uh, better leave it off until we're actually ready for party time. So we just set it for 0 and 600, so it always stays in one position. Now, the great thing about this recreation room is, I mean, it has an absolute ton of decor. Additionally, you know what's better than one recreation room? Two. That's the reason we put a jukebox in this one. We take a look at Grimlock, we were mentioning that decor. His current environmental decor standing those tiles is 454. That is huge. For instance, we can take a look at Prowl here. They have a morale of 52. Now 16 is coming from the last superb meal. But look at last cycle's decor. We're getting a gorgeous bonus of plus 12. In addition to the recreation room's beautiful decor, they also give them the dupes recently danced and played video games for plus two each. Not bad for a dupe who only has a morale requirement of six. Now, they're not all that good. Close, but for instance, Scrapper here. Scrapper only has a morale of 43. Nothing to shake a stick at, but it's because last cycle's decor is average plus three. And it's because, look at this dude. In his free time, instead of hanging out in the recreation rooms, he's hanging out here. Here's another example, Broadside. You know, we're gonna hang out over here. Well, it's not horrible decor. It's not as good as down here, that's for sure. If you regularly watch the channel, you'll know that I just recently did a poke shell tutorial. And the reason why is because I was sitting here messing around with the colony and wanted to do some experimentation on a, a different design. So I was like, you know what? Let's make a tutorial out of it. But long story short, the printing pod gave us a poke shell. We hadn't seen one yet, which lucky for us, we have an absolute ton of polluted dirt. All of these are filled with polluted dirt, except one with slime, and I think another one holds some oxalite. Either way, we have enough polluted dirt to feed two poke shells for a very long time. I'm confident we'll have enough polluted dirt to go around long after we stop playing this colony. So it's definitely not something we need to worry about. Now the setup is fairly simple. Remember, poke shells don't like eggs and their stables more so than everybody else. Or rather, they like to guard their eggs and start hurting your dupes. So we take all the eggs and we put them in this little container here. And that way, whenever one of them grows up or dies, it produces that poke shell molt. And the dupes, they don't have access to go through this door. So they stand right here, they grab the poke shell molt, and they throw it in our beautiful rock crusher. Well, we turn it into lime. We've also made some modifications to our liquid hydrogen. We managed to get the chill exactly where we want it by putting a couple of radiant pipes in here. 
it really helped offset the difference between the distance of the ice and the window tiles. So now our hydrogen stays at pretty good temperature. But at that point, I still wasn't happy with how much hydrogen was coming out. So we stripped the power collection off the top of the Rodriguez. The colony's powering it now. But the great thing, though, is now all the hydrogen that this thing produces goes directly to liquid hydrogen production. But since we're paying the power cost, we needed some additional sources of power. Well, don't worry, because we've been busy on Smellyl. As a matter of fact, old Ironhide has been very busy. We've managed to core out a significant portion of this entire planetoid. And since we've got plenty of oil, we also disassembled our oil collection here. And since we didn't have that significant a power requirement, we're siphoning off the rest of the natural gas and sending it back to Fertilla. Long story short, we've now expanded to three natural gas generators and they do a decent job of supplementing the coal generators whenever they get activated, whenever there is a lack of volcano or geothermal power. But the name of the game today is Paku. And boy, do I have a treat for you. We're all used to these sort of complicated Paku ranches where once you've reached the number of Paku that you want, you grab an egg and you put it into a separate storage and then an egg gets added to the colony once it hatches. I've got an easier solution for you. But first, we need to go over some Paku basics. Paku require eight tiles of space. Any smaller than that, and they become confined. And these are the two terms that you really need to be comfortable with. Confined versus overcrowded. You can see, even though it is three Paku in this one eight tile space, they still are only overcrowded. And being that they're overcrowded, they get a minus five to happiness. But that's okay. Even at a minus six happiness for the Paku, their reproduction is still at 7% per cycle. So even though they are smashed in here, there's three Paku in here, and, and each tame Paku like eight tile of space, they are still going to produce an egg. As evidenced by the eggshell and the little baby Paku fry. But this Paku over here only has six tiles of space. And you can see that they are confined, which gives them a minus 10 to happiness. And at that type of happiness, their reproduction is 0% per cycle. Why does this matter? Well, in our ranch, we have four pack who are tamed and happy. Happy because they're eaten from the fish feeder. We'll get to that more in a second. But because they're happy, they're getting an extra 60% per cycle. That means they're laying more than one egg every two cycles. When they lay the egg, it gets scooped up by the conveyor and put into our little egg storage where eventually they hatch and fall and end up in here. And you can see, even though we just started this ranch, there are already 43 Paku in this space. There's at least eight tiles in this room. So every single one of these Paku, even though they're in only one tile of water, still have a reproduction of 7% per cycle. This makes this incredibly powerful. Eventually, this Paku tank could contain a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand Paku. Basically enough to where your game's just going to keep crashing or bogging down so slow you're not going to be able to do anything. And the key to it is the fact that they're only overcrowded and not cramped. So how does our wonderful system here work? Well, it's fairly simple. We've all seen the Paku farms where you have to take the egg and you move it around and when and when your ranch needs fish, you move the egg to a certain chamber where it then flops out. I present to you the Paku plank. The Paku plank is the beautiful way this whole system works. Anytime this critter sensor detects less than four critters in this ranch, the Paku plank, aka the bunker door, closes. And then when one of these fry eggs hatches, it'll bounce all the way over and then splash into the ranch. When it's open, the Paku, whenever they hatch, flop over, fall through the bunker door, and then end up in our little infinite Paku pond. This auto sweeper here is responsible for taking all the eggs out of the infinite Paku farm and doing the same thing, throwing them up here into our little incubation area. Now, you'll notice there's two incubation areas. 
And that's because we don't want any gulp paku or tropical paku in here. They have a tropical fry egg chance of 2% and a gulp fry egg chance of 2%. So whenever a gulp or a tropical fry egg is hatched, they're loaded into this conveyor loader. Here's an example of a regular fry egg just getting scooped up. But if it was a gulp or a tropical fry egg, it would come to this conveyor loader and go across these rails and dump into this one. And the reason is simple. We don't want any gulp or tropical in here. Gulp paku turn polluted water into fresh water. And then you're starting to play around with water versus polluted water, and then you have a huge mess. Here's an example right here of a paku fry that just hatched and bouncing his way to the infinite paku pond. A couple of other notes. To get paku started, you really need to get them tamed with algae. There's a bug or it's not as consistent when you're using seeds. Now, as soon as you have your tamed paku producing eggs, you can switch it over to seeds. And we don't ever have to worry about running out of seeds, as example by our bristle blossoms here. In the original game, they could only eat algae. Now, they can eat any seed and algae. And because we have an infinite source of blossom feeds, that's what we're feeding them. Now, because of that, they don't produce much polluted dirt. In fact, only 0.15 kilos per cycle they excrete half of what they eat in the form of polluted dirt. We have a conveyor loader here that's responsible for picking up all the paku fillets and the eggshells and polluted dirt that they may produce. The eggshells get filtered by this solid filter and they end up just coming down here with the rest of the eggs as they hatch. Everything else goes into here. The only thing we're caring about is that polluted dirt. We don't have to worry about it going off because as soon as the polluted dirt hits it goes into our storage bin remember anytime for some reason we have food that goes off we have an auto sweeper here that's going to pick the polluted dirt up and throw it in this storage bin and then some dupe's going to come by and grab it and put it into our permanent polluted dirt storage paku will not lay eggs if they are overcrowded and there's an egg in their room that's the reason why these two little chambers are separated by doors. They're all separate rooms. You can see here we have 16 eggs waiting to hatch in this room. There are zero in here right now because, well, no Paku have been laying any gulp fry or tropical fry eggs. It's a pretty simple setup. We even have a couple of deodorizers in here to capitalize on all the polluted oxygen being produced. So we are always going to have more clay. So in our ecosystem, we now basically have a Infinite supply of eggshells and paku. And you know we love the eggshells for the beauty of the lime. An important note about paku and their movements. Paku can go in any direction where there's water. Which means their navigational mesh, in other words, where they're heading, is typically more intensive than it is for a normal critter that can only walk on the ground. It's for this reason why this infinite Paku pond is only one tile. If it was any more than one tile, it would have to compute where each of these Paku is going back and forth. And that would be a very big headache. Even with just one tile, eventually the game will not be able to handle it. Some additional details on the Paku. They only live for 25 cycles. Five of which, they're a Paku fry. In other words, a Paku baby. As luck would have it, this Paku is reaching the end of his life cycle. He's 25 of 25. So we're going to get to see the Paku plank in action. That Paku just passed away. And our Paku plank is closing. This critter sensor says, hey, there's not above three. We need to do something about it. And it shuts this bunker door. And here we have a beautiful Paku fry hatching. We'll go ahead and fast forward this so you can watch the Paku Fry walk the plank. And that's it. Now the critter sensor knows there's four Paku in here. So it opens the door again. When it does, any eggshell drops down. And it'll get picked up by our beautiful auto sweeper. Unless, of course, a dupe got the errand before it did. Now, the only wrench that you can throw in this system is in the rare case that two fry eggs hatch at the exact same time. In that case, you'd have two Paku flopping across the plank and dropping in, 
which means there'd be five Paku in this tank and not four. And with five Paku in this tank, they would then get overcrowded and their reproduction would drop to 7% per cycle instead of the beautiful, happy reproduction rate of plus 900%, which equates down to 60% per cycle. But it'll self-regulate. Remember, these Paku only live for 25 cycles. Eventually, one of these Paku will die. Then there will only be four Paku in here. And everything will be right as rain. In addition to the beautiful eggshell production and the little bit of polluted dirt, we also have the bonus of now having some beautiful Paku fillets. And what does that mean for us? Surf and turf. With 1,600 calories of cooked fish and 4,000 calories of barbecue, we get a beautiful surf and turf. So we bring all the Paku fillets down in here. The electric grill scoops them up, turns 1,000 kilos of Paku fillet into 1,600 kilos of cooked fish, and then transfers it over to the gas range, where we get the beautiful surf and turf. And there's Sideswipe and Moonracer eating some beautiful surf and turf now. Unfortunately for this series, you'll notice that it's cycle 1,700. We've played this one colony for almost 120 hours. Well, that's a lot of time. Now, we still have a few more things that I want to do, and we're definitely going to make it the cycle 2000. I don't think we're going to be able to round the circle with the, the gas range productions. Quite simply, I don't think the simulation can handle it. We have a lot of automation around the map. We have a complete colony on Smellio that we're cleaning all up, which it will get a little bit better as we sweep the rest of this up. Speaking of which, everything is getting swept up and thrown into this automatic dispenser, and everything is being loaded into this conveyor loader, which then sends it back to Fertilera. I mean, we have a ton of stuff in this pile. Eventually, we're going to have an entire planetoid's worth. I want to take a moment to discuss the Paku plank and why we chose a bunker door for it. We're here on a test map, and you can see I got a, a small polluted water pond with a couple of Paku in here. Nothing big, nothing fancy. If you didn't know, Paku will always flop in the direction of the water. You can see this little guy here, he'll bounce around once and twice, but because the doors are closed, he doesn't know what direction to head into. But as soon as I destroy these doors, he knows exactly where the water is. And jumps on down. So back to the question why the bunker door itself. You can't use the pneumatic door because the critters will just fall right through it. As you can see. But they will stop on a manual airlock. And they will stop on a mechanized airlock. And in each time, they'll bounce and flop down. And they're headed towards the closest point of water. Now one more time, just because it's fun to drop Paku. There we go. Let's, let's drop a bunch of Paku. So if the Paku go through the nomadic doors and stop on the manual airlocks, the mechanized airlocks, and the bunker doors, why'd we choose the bunker door? Well, in this example, the way this stable came out, it was sort of for two reasons. First, we didn't want the auto sweeper to be close enough to be able to grab the eggs right out of the conveyor chutes. But we did need the auto sweeper to be close enough to grab from the pond. The second, well, because the bunker door is bigger and it looks more like a plank. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of modifications to this design you can do. Whatever works for you, that's the best method in my book. I suppose we could have used two mechanized airlocks and connected them both to the automation. And then they would be just as long and they would open and close faster. Let's try that out and see if we like it better. All right, we have the Paku Plank 2.0 installed. Now we just got to get rid of a couple of Paku to test it out. Here, fishy, fishy, fishy. Here's our first little test fishy now. And the Paku's finally be able to jump over into the tank. The doors open, the eggshells drop, and the Paku falls in. And now that the doors are open, the next fishy drops down and is going to head into the infinite Paku pool. I don't know. We might leave it with the mechanized airlocks. I do kind of like that they open and close much quicker. Either way, I'm sure all of you will come up with some interesting designs using the Paku plank yourself. I can't wait to see them hear about them. I hope you had as much fun watching this episode as I did creating it. Talk to you soon.